Section 16 of Astounding Stories, Number 12, December 1930, by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ape Men of Zlotli, by David R. Sparks, Chapter 3. At the beginning of the eleventh morning in the valley, Kirby had again posted himself close to the mouth of the black tunnel, and again felt that hidden eyes were observing him. But this morning differed from the first morning, because now, for the first time, he was ready to do something about the watcher or watchers. Exploration of the whole valley had not helped. Therefore, there lay at his feet a considerable coil of rope, the manufacture of which from plaited strands of the tough grass in his Eden had taken him whole days. With what patience he could find, he was waiting for the gigantic spout of milky-colored perfumed water which would mean that the geyser had gone off and would erupt no more for exactly forty-four minutes. Eleven days in the valley. While he waited, Kirby considered them. Who had made the beautiful footprints beside him, when he had slept at last after his arrival here? Why had so many of the queer fuzzy-topped shrubs with immense yam-shaped roots which grew here been taken away during that first sleep, and during all his other periods of sleep? Who had taken them? Early in his stay he had learned that the tuber-like roots were good to eat and would sustain life, and he supposed that the unseen people of the valley took them for food. But who were these people of the valley? Who had laid beside him during his first sleep? Near the immense lily with perfume like that which came from the milky geyser spray, that spray of death and delight mingled. Why had someone scratched a line in the earth from him directly to the distant orifice of the geyser? Was this, as he believed, a signal to come not only to the edge of the orifice, but to lower himself down into its depths? And if the line were intended as a signal, did the persons who came to the valley while he slept, always eluding him, wish him well, or mean to do him harm? Last question of all. Had the beautiful girl's face he believed he had seen just once been real or an hallucination? It had been while he was kneeling at the very edge of the geyser cone, staring down its many-colored throat, that the vision had appeared. Misty white amidst the green gloom, the face had been turned up to him, smiling, its lips forming a kiss, and its great eyes beckoning. Had the face been real, or a dream? Eleven days in the valley. Now, with his braided rope ready at last, he was going to do something which might help to answer his questions. Kirby reached out and began to run his grass rope, yard by yard, through his hands, searching carefully for any flaw. A canyon wren made the air sweet above him, while the morning sun began to wink and blink against the shadows which still lay against the face of the guardian cliffs. Kirby glanced at his watch and got up. Crossing beyond the mouth of the geyser, he grinned good morning at his friend the conquistador, and marched on into the shade of the live oak which grew nearest the geyser. Here he made one end of his rope fast to the gnarled trunk, inspected his pistol patted his tunic to make sure that the cylinder of gold was safe, then stood by to await the geyser. With the passing of three minutes there came from the still empty orifice a sonorous rumbling. Kirby grinned. From deep in the earth issued a sound of fizzing and bubbling, and then to the accompaniment of subterranean thunder burst loose the milky upward column which had never ceased to awe the man who watched so eagerly this morning. As the titanic jet leaped skyward now, the slanting rays of the sun caught it, and turned the water, fanning out into a fire opal, into a sheet of living color. Kirby, hard-headed to the last, drew from the supply in one pocket of his tunic a strip of one of the tuber-like roots, and munched it. The thunder ceased. The waters receded. After that Kirby hesitated not a second. Promptly he moved forward, flung his coil of line down into the geyser tunnel, and swung on to the line. By the time he had swallowed the last bite of his breakfast, the world he knew had been left behind, and he was climbing down. It became at once apparent that the gorgeously colored, glassy smooth throat glowed with tints which were unfamiliar to him. He could perceive these new shades of color, yet had no name for them. As he stopped after fifty feet to breathe, the color phenomenon made him wonder if the tuber roots he had been eating had affected his vision then decided they had not. In addition to food value, the roots had some power to stimulate courage and a slight mental exhilaration, but the drug had proved non-habit-forming, 
and Kirby knew that his powers of perception were not now, and never had been, affected. He swung down further. Just a moment after he began that progress was when things began to happen to him. First he heard what seemed to be the low titter of a human voice, laughing sweetly. Next came a far-off, unutterably lovely strumming of music, and then he realized that, at a depth of about a hundred feet, he was hanging level with a hole which marked the mouth of another tunnel. This new tunnel sloped down into the earth on his right hand. The floor and walls were glassy smooth, and the angle of descent was steep, but by no means as steep as the drop of the vertical geyser shaft in which he now hung. Laughter! Music! The new tunnel suddenly aroused an excitement which made him quiver. "'When I saw her,' he gasped, "'she was standing here, in the mouth of this tunnel, looking up at me.' Violently, Freddy Kirby forgot the maple-shaded street of his Kansas town, forgot everything but desire to reach the mouth of the new tunnel, where the girl of the exquisite face and beckoning lips had stood. Tightening his grip on the rope, he began to swing himself back and forth, like a pendulum. It seemed probable that when the geyser water shot up past the horizontal tunnel, its force was so great that no water at all entered. He redoubled his efforts to widen his swing. Then his feet scraped on the floor, and in a second he had alighted there. He still hung stoutly to his line, however, for the tunnel sloped down sharply enough and was slippery enough to prohibit the maintenance of footing unaided. The music which issued from the depths of that stunningly mysterious passage swelled to a crescendo, and stopped. Kirby clung there to his precarious perch, his feet slipping on the glass under them with every move he made, and feelings stirred in his heart which had never been there before. Then, as silence reigned where the music had been, something prompted him to look up. The next instant he stifled a cry. With widening eyes he saw the flash of a white arm and the gleam of a knife hovering over the spot where his taut rope passed out of the geyser opening into the sunshine of the outer world. Again he stifled a cry, for crying out would do no good. While the suppressed sound was still on his lips the knife flickered. Then Kirby was shooting downward, the severed line whipping out after him. The first plunge flung him off his feet. A long swoop which he took on his back dizzied him but as the fall continued he was able to slow it a little by bracing arms and legs against the tunnel walls. "'Holy Jehoshaphat!' he gurgled. But there seemed to be no particular danger. The slide was as smooth as most of the chutes he had ever encountered at summer swimming pools. If ever the confounded spiral passage came to an end, he might find that he was still all right. As seconds passed, and he fell and fell, it seemed that he was bound for the center of the earth. It seemed that he swished around a multiple bend, and eyes which had been accustomed to darkness were blinded by light. It was light which radiated in all colors—blue, yellow, browns, purples, reds, pinks, and then all the new colors for which he had no name. Somehow Kirby knew that he had shot out of the tunnel, which emerged high up in the face of the cliff, and that he was dropping through the perfumed, brilliant air resonant with the sound of birds and insects and human cries. The funny thing was that the pull of gravity was not right, somehow, and he was dropping fairly slowly. From far below, a body of what looked like water was sweeping up to meet him. Kirby closed his eyes. When he opened them again, his whole body was stinging with the slap of his impact, and he found that it was water which he had struck. The proof of it lay in the fact that he was swimming, and was approaching a shore. But such water! It was milky white and perfumed as the geyser flow had been, and it seemed luminous as with a radium fire. Had he not realized presently that the fluid probably contained enough arsenic to finish a thousand like him, he would have thought of himself as bathing in the waters of paradise. But then he began to forget about the poison which might already be at work upon him. Ahead of him, stretched out in the gorgeous colored light, ran a beach which was backed by heavy jungle and on the beach stood the lovely creatures, all clad in shimmering, glistening garments, whose flute-like cries had come to him as he fell. Kirby looked, and became almost powerless to continue his swim. The beauty of those frail women was like the reputed beauty of bright angels. That paralyzing effect of wonder, however, did not last long. 
The girls moved forward to the water's edge, and, laughing amongst themselves, beckoned to him with lovely slender hands, whose every motion was a caress. "'Be not afraid,' called one in a curious patois dialect, about five-sixths of which seemed to be made up of Spanish words, distorted but recognizable. "'The water would kill you,' called another, as it killed the Spaniard in armor. But we are here to save you. I will give you a draught to drink which will defeat the poison. Come on to us." Kirby's heart was almost literally in his mouth now, because the girl who promised him salvation was she whose lips had formed a kiss at him from the green gloomy throat of the geyser. His feet struck a shale bottom. Panting, he stood up and was conscious of the fact that, despite his forlornly dripping and disheveled condition, he was tall and straight and big and that for some reason all of the girls on the gleaming sand, and one girl in particular, were anxious to receive him here. The one girl had drawn a small gleaming flask of gold from the misty bodice of her gown, and was holding it out while she laughed with red lips and great dazzling dark eyes. "'Pronto!' she called in pure Spanish, and the other girls echoed the word. "'Oh!' went on the bright owner of the flask. We thought you would never have done with your work on the rope. It took you so long." Kirby left the smooth lake behind him and stood dripping on the sand. The moment the air touched his clothes he felt that they were stiffening slightly. Yet the sensation brought no terror. He could not feel terror as he faced the girls. "'Give him the flask, Naida!' someone exclaimed. "'Ah, but the gods have been kind to us!' echoed another. The girl with the flask made a gesture for silence. "'Is it Naida you are called?' Kirby put in quickly, and as he spoke the Spanish words, the roll of them in his tongue did much to make him know that he was sane and awake, and not dreaming, that this was still the twentieth century, and that he was Freddy Kirby. Answering his question, Naida nodded, and gave him the flask. "'A single draught will act as antidote to the poison,' she said. "'I drink,' said Kirby, as he raised the flask, "'to the many of you who have been so gracious as to save me.' A flashing smile, a blush, was his answer, and then he had wetted his lips with, and was swallowing, a limpid liquid which tasted of some drug. Enough, Naida ordered in a second. As she reached for the flask, her companions closed in as though a ceremony of some sort had been completed. Is it time to tell him yet, Naida? piped one of the girls, younger than the rest, whom some one had called Elana. Oh, do begin, Naida! chorused two more. We can't wait much longer to find out if he is going to help us." Kirby turned to Naida, while a soothing sensation crept through him from the draught he had taken. "'Pray tell me what it is that I am to be permitted to do for you. I can promise you that the whole of my life and strength, and such intelligence as I possess, is yours to command.' Excited small cries and a clapping of hands answered him. As for Naida, her face lighted with glowing joy. Oh, one who could say that must be the friend and protector of whom we have stood in such bitter need. What, asked Kirby, is this need which made one of you cut my rope so that I should come here? A momentary silence was broken only by the hum of insects in the perfumed air, and by the golden thrilling of a bird back in the jungle. Then Kirby beheld Naida bowing to him. So be it, she said in a voice low and flute-like. I will speak now since you request it. Already you have seen that you are here in our world, because we conspired amongst ourselves to bring you here. Our reason—she paused, looked deep into his eyes. Amigo, she continued slowly, we whom you see here are the people of the temple. For more centuries than even our sages can tell, our progenitors have dwelt here, where you find us, knowing always of your outer world, but remaining always unknown by it. But now the time has come when those of us who are left amongst our race need the help of one from the outer races we have shunned. Dangers of various orders confront us who have waited here for your coming. When we first discovered you in the Valley of the Geyser, the idea came to me that we must make you understand our troubles, and ask of you—' But then she stopped. As Kirby stared at her, the gentleness of her expression was replaced by a swift strength which made her majestic. The next moment Bedlam reigned upon the beach. "'They are after us!' gasped one of the girls in terror. "'Quick, Naida! Quick! Quick!' Whatever it was that threatened Naida did not need to be told that the need for action was pressing. 
She shouted at her companions some order which Kirby did not understand. From a pouch at her side she snatched out a grayish, spherical vegetable substance, which looked almost like a tennis ball. Then she braced herself as if to withstand an assault. "'Stand back!' she cried to Kirby. He had long ago ceased to wonder at anything that might happen here. Disappointed that Naida's story had been interrupted, wondering what was wrong, he obeyed Naida's order to keep clear. As he fell back and stood motionless, there came from behind a dense screen of shrubs, which would have resembled aloe and prickly pear bushes, save that they were as big as oak trees, a ghastly howling, the next second hopped and hurtled across the beach, toward the girls, a group of hair-covered, shaggy creatures, which were neither apes nor men. The faces contorted with lust were hideously leathery and brown, the foreheads small and beetling, and the mouths enormous with immense yellow teeth. Helpless, Kirby realized that Naida and all the others had clapped over their faces curious masks, which seemed to be made of some crystalline substance, and that now others had armed themselves with the tennis balls, and that was the last observation he made before the battle opened furiously. With a cry muffled behind her mask, Naida leaped out in front of her squadron and cut loose her queer vegetable ball with whizzing aim and force. Full into the snarling face of one of the ape-men, the thing smashed, filling the air all about the creature with a yellow mist-like powder. Kirby was half deafened by the yells of rage and terror which went up from the entire attacking band. The creature who had been hit fell to his knees the while he made agonized tearing movements at his face, and uttered shrill, jabbering yelps. Other balls flashed instantly from Naida's ranks, and each brought about the same ghastly result as the first, but then Kirby saw that the whole jungle seethed with the hairy, awful men. "'Keep back!' Naida shrieked at him through her mask. "'We have no mask for you. If the powder from our fungi touches you, it will be the end.' With gaps in the advancing line filled as soon as each screeching ape went down, the attackers leaped on until Kirby knew they would be upon the girls in a matter of seconds. A sweat broke out on his neck. But then an idea gripped him, and suddenly, without even a last glance at Naida, he leaped away even as she had commanded. A great boulder lay on the shore fifty yards away. Toward it Kirby streaked as though he had become a coward. But he had not turned coward. By the time he reached the shelter which would protect him from the fungus mist, a turning point had come in the battle. The ape-men had closed in on the girls, were swarming about them, and the mist-balls had almost ceased to fly. But the thing which gave Kirby hope was that the apes were not attempting to harm the girls. They seemed victors, but they were not committing atrocities. It was the sharp intuition that something like this might happen which had sent Kirby fleeing from the fight. He believed he might yet prove useful. The thick-set group of attackers were jostling about Naida. As the screams and sobs of the girls quivered out, mingled with the guttural roaring of the men, Naida was shut off by a solid wall of aggressors. Then Kirby saw her again, but now two of the most powerful of the ape-men had caught her up and was carrying her. Her kicking and writhing and biting accomplished nothing. The apes were headed directly back to the jungle. Now, however, most of the yellow mist had disappeared, and that was all Kirby had been waiting for. With a growling shout he tore out from behind his boulder, his luger ready. Naida's captors were in full retreat, and other pairs of men were snatching up other girls and hopping after them. Toward Naida Kirby ran madly but not blindly. "'Naida! Naida!' he bellowed. He got in two strides for every one the apes made. "'Naida!' he shouted, and at last saw her look at him. Her face was pallid with loathing and terror. As her glimmering dark eyes met his, they flashed a plea which made his heart thrash against his lungs. With a final roar of encouragement, Kirby closed in on the hair-covered men, and fired instantly a shot which caught one full in the heart. The creature wavered on its legs, looked at the unexpected enemy with dismayed, swinish little red eyes, and relaxing his hold upon Naida, dropped without making a sound. After that, but suddenly Kirby found himself unable to comprehend fully the other terrific results of his intervention. Before the echoes of his shot died, there came to him the rumble of what seemed to be tons of falling rock. In the bright air a slight mist was precipitated, to all of which was added the effect upon the ape-men of fear of a weapon, 
and a type of fighter utterly new to them. Kirby had fired believing that he would have to fight other ape-men when the first fell. But not so. Instead of that, he blinked rapidly as he took in the scene. Naida had been released. Lying on the sand beside the dead ape-man, she was looking up at him in stupefied wonder, and her other captor, instead of remaining to fight, had clapped shaggy hands over his ears and was leaping headlong for the protection of the jungle. Moreover, the soprano cries of the girls and the deep howls of the men were rising everywhere, and everywhere the ape-men were dropping their captives and plunging away after their leader. Huh. Kirby muttered aloud, and wondered what the citizens of Kansas would have to say about this. Naida looked at the dead and bleeding ape-man and shuddered, and then at the score or so of others brought down by the puffballs. Then she looked up at Kirby, raised her arms for his support, and smiled up into his brown face. Kirby forgot Kansas, lifted her, warm and alive, radiantly beautiful, in his arms. "'Our friends, the enemies!' she whispered as she remained for a second in his embrace, and then drew away. "'We'll attack no more this day, thanks to you.' There was no possible need for another shot, Kirby saw. In terrified silence the first of the apes had already floundered behind the prickly pear and aloe bushes, and the last stragglers were using all the power in their legs to catch up. On the beach Naida's followers were picking themselves up, and already a few of them had burst into ringing laughter. "'Come on, all of you,' Naida said to them, and including Kirby in her glance, added, "'We may as well go to the cacique now, and have it over with.'" End of chapter 3